Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and we are talking immigration again. Today's uh, special guest expert is Christine Swenson of Swenson Law Office PC, located in Denver, Colorado. A little bit about Christy, uh, Christine. Sorry, Her firm is dedicated to helping all people realize their immigration dreams, whether that's through family sponsorship, assisting crime victims, or employers hiring foreign national employees. She has almost 20 years experience as an attorney and opened her law firm just a few years ago. Uh, She chose to dedicate her practice to immigration law based on her own experience with the the U.S. immigration system. Uh, Christine and her husband adopted their daughter and during that long process she lived through and survived the very same immigration system her clients do today. So... Um, Let's start with that, Christine. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Let's start with uh, your own immigration experience. Tell us a little bit about that. And uh, obviously, that was the reason that you got into immigration yourself. It is. Our our family grew by choice through adoption. Um, My husband and I had talked about it on and off over the years, and we decided that Adoption was going to be the best option for us from really the start of our relationship. Um, when we finally were in a position to start our process, uh, as you indicated, we did adopt internationally. Um, in order to do that, we had to go through not only the U.S. immigration system, but our daughter's home country's immigration system. Um, so having gone through the U.S. immigration system and Quite frankly, we didn't do it with an attorney. We did it with an adoption agency. And my being an attorney, I thought, you know, how bad could it be? Um, Well, now I know. Um, There are so many different rules. Some of them are arbitrary, quite honestly. Uh, And so through that experience, I, I routinely found myself putting my forehead against a brick wall and wondering why can't this process be easier Um, Why can't this process be more streamlined? Why can't this process be um, more welcoming in in all reality? Um, And having gone through that system and then having gone through our daughter's system, I realized that there are hundreds of thousands, and if you listen to the news and you see the numbers of upwards of 5 to 11 million immigrants here in the U.S., those folks are struggling. They are trying to do things on their own, and this is not a very simple or straightforward process for pretty much everybody. Um, after going through that system ourselves, I talked with my husband, and we decided that opening a law firm would be a great idea, and it would be a way for me to give back to families who are facing these same struggles And it's really what drives me and my staff as well, because they have their own immigration experiences, um, that we bring that passion to the table every day when we advocate for our clients through whatever process they're seeking. Yeah, and I find that with a lot of people who are involved in immigration now is they do have their uh, own personal stories to tell. So they really are. Uh, educators and advocates uh, for the success of people who are going through the same problems. Uh, Funnily, my own story with uh, immigration is very similar. We actually, we didn't adopt. It was, uh, we hosted a child from Latvia, although he was 17 when he came over here, so he was too old to adopt. So right now he is on a student visa, but we have also hosted another uh, three people from Eastern Europe who have, you know, found their forever families that way as well. But it is a very complicated process. Yes, most definitely. And even based on my own experience, I I don't wish anybody um, to go through the U.S. immigration system on their own. Um, there, there's just so much to consider. There are not only the statutes and the regulations that are in place, but then in addition there's there's case law, there are memos and opinions that can alter all of those things. 
Um, and really the focus is about one being, making sure one is eligible for the process to start. Um, it's not just about a bunch of forms. Right. And through your own experience with uh, adopting, is, is that now what you concentrate your law practice on? What is your specialization, would you say, when it comes to immigration? Well, under the general concept of U.S. immigration law, there are probably four subsections. Uh, one is families, two is humanitarian, three is employment, and four is deportation, or what they now call officially as removal from the United States. Mm -hmm. um, we, we focus on three out of those four. We focus on families um, so that any any U.S. citizen wants to petition um, or sponsor a non-U.S. citizen relative, uh, they can do that. We help families, whether they're spouses, their children, stepchildren, uh, parents, siblings, all, all manner of immediate family from that standpoint. Uh, we also work in the humanitarian area where we work extensively with crime victims, whether those be survivors of domestic violence or other types of crimes. And one of the, one of the offerings that's available to victims of crime is a special visa that can ultimately lead to permanent residency. And then if they so decided uh, to apply for U.S. citizenship as well. And then the third area that we work in is employment-based. Um, and that's a that's a very broad area from that standpoint because we're dealing with employers uh, bringing on board or renewing uh, visas for their employees to make sure that the employers have the right people in the positions that they need to fill in order to thrive as a business. Um, so in essence, our goal is to make it easier for non-U.S. citizens to enter the U.S. legally and to work here legally as well. Mm -hmm. So walk me through the scenarios of each of those areas that you cover. First with uh, families, talk to me about some of the problems that they have, the fears that they have, and what you do to help solve them. Certainly. With respect to families, what we find more often than not is that uh, people fall in love with other people. They don't fall in love with people who are necessarily U.S. citizens or have lawful immigration status and things of that sort. And so we, in essence, at the bottom line, help families stay together. Um, there are families where uh, one spouse will petition for their other spouse, whether it be a same-sex couple or a, a different sex couple, and they want their family to stay together. Um, there are situations where we've had clients who have had very difficult situations where one spouse entered the U.S. without permission, and now they want to try and get their spouse's paperwork in order so that they can stay, ultimately become a resident, and if they choose, ultimately become a U.S. citizen. And there are certain and special obstacles with that when someone enters the U.S. without permission. We need to make sure that they're eligible for a waiver of that time that they've been in the U.S. Uh, without permission. It, that phrase for immigration is called unlawful presence. Um, and people gather or accrue unlawful presence from the moment they enter without permission. Um, but what's the harder part is that when they leave the U.S., which invariably many applicants or beneficiaries uh, ultimately have to do, those beneficiaries then, as soon as they leave U.S. soil, can be barred from returning to the U.S. for either three or ten years, depending on how much unlawful presence they've accrued. So there are special waivers and requirements for those waivers that we need to make sure that they meet um, because immigration is not necessarily a very forgiving system uh, when it comes to people entering the U.S. without permission. And I suppose there's a lot of fear that goes along with that to actually get the legality of their status corrected if they think that there are going to be uh, threats of deportation? 
Absolutely. Uh, there are many families we've met with who don't want to risk filing applications on behalf of their fa other family members because they're afraid that if they are denied, they are going to be put in deportation proceedings and shipped out of the U.S. And for, for some, they've never been to their home country since they were either an infant or a child. They have no recollection. They have no contacts there. They have no ability to establish a life there um, because they don't know anything about that country. They, they are, for all intents and purposes, you know, Americans. Um, so, yes, there is that fear, and there are some processes that are more protected than others, and there are a couple of humanitarian processes that are much better about that if, in fact, somebody is going to be denied that immigration, uh, the immigration service has taken the stance that they will not turn them over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, for deportation, and that's mostly found in the humanitarian sector of immigration. Right. And each one, when it comes to families, you know, each case is uh, different and each case is personal. And I think uh, a lot of people don't realize when, you know, we hear about immigration on television that it really is about families and, you know, splitting families apart, which uh, makes it a bigger issue than just, uh, you know, building a wall. Exactly. Exactly. Go There's. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to change subject there and talk about more of the humanitarian immigration. Uh, if you want to, you know, talk about a couple of the issues there, the problems that they're having, and you know how they can be solved. Certainly, uh, the the primary process that we work with for humanitarian immigration is called the U visa. It's just the letter U. One of the things if your audience hasn't heard is that immigration is all about different letters of visas, and it's quite the alphabet soup. Um, but the one particularly that we work ex extensively with is called the U visa, and that is for victims of crime and understanding that Colorado has its own set of criminal statutes, New York has its own set, California, et cetera. Uh, the U visa is a provision and an opportunity for victims to, in essence, regularize their status if they have reported the crime and participated fully in the system, the criminal justice system, um, to hold that individual accountable. What we have found and what has been well documented, both from a sociological standpoint and a criminal justice standpoint, is that many immigrants feel disenfranchised from our criminal justice system, uh, whether that be a result of their own home, home tree experiences where oftentimes police are corrupt or police do not support the rights of women, um, and as a result, those women are exploited within their own countries. So Congress had established the U visa in order to encourage immigrants who would otherwise be very reluctant to report a crime and to follow through that criminal justice system process to hold someone accountable. Um, it is an extraordinarily useful visa. It's helped tens and tens of thousands of victims across the country um, in the last few years, it has become increasingly more popular uh, because it has a wide, wider range of waiver provisions uh, for those who've entered the country without permission or who may have been uh, may have entered the country several times without permission. Uh, so, from the standpoint, a U visa may be somebody's only hope to remain in the U.S. The problem with the U visa at this point, and frankly with a lot of visas as far as the U.S. immigration system, is that the U visa has a cap or a maximum number of visas that can be issued every single year. For the U visa, that cap is 10,000 visas. Now, that sounds like a lot, um, but it has in the years just since I started practicing immigration law over the last five years, that has gone and been assigned to people uh, in, in, in increasing speed so that now the Immigration Service is looking at applications and reviewing 
in determining whether or not they're eligible for the visa. And if they are eligible for the visa, applicants may not actually receive their visa for up to two to three years and possibly as long as five because it has been reached. And immigration has, in essence, promised visas to individuals, um, you know, for several years into the future. The only way that cap can be changed is if Congress takes that issue up and addresses it and increases that cap. Right, and there's uh, you know, the need is greater than the visas that are available, and I imagine that is the same case when it comes to employment as well. There's only a certain amount of visas available for certain employment and immigration. Yes, that's true. Um, one of the more uh, well-known visas from an employment standpoint is called an H-1B. Again, the alphabet soup of immigration. Mm -hmm. um, those visas are capped at 65,000 every year. And there are other restrictions and limitations in place. Um, at a minimum, applicants for that particular employment visa um, need to have at least a bachelor degree in order to be eligible to apply. And then they need to be within a certain set of identified specialty occupations in order to apply. Um, thankfully, um, there are additional visas available for those who have master's degrees or PhDs, and that's terrific. But unfortunately, we have between two and two and a half times the number of applicants for that visa than we have visas. Um, so it's gotten to the point where it is literally a lottery, and immigration will pull names or however they draw them and review their applications. And if they qualify, then terrific. And if they don't, then they can go to the next person um, they pull out of the lottery. So the difficulty with that particular example is that those numbers were based off of, frankly, how the U.S. was in the 1950s. Um, it's painfully out of date and needs to be updated. And yet again, just like the U visas, only Congress can address that and change those caps. And, and speaking of changes, we're in the midst of a presidential election and, you, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen when it comes to immigration. What are your thoughts about what's going on right now? With respect to the presidential election, we've worked with a lot of immigrants who are calling us trying to find out if there's anything they can do to regularize their status so they can remain in the U.S. Um, in reality, no matter what soundbite is being played in the media, um, immigration is not going to do a massive overhaul and start deporting 11 million people. Um, in fact, there's the U.S. Supreme Court on the 18th of April just heard oral arguments in the case of U.S. versus Texas, which is the challenge by 26 states to President Obama's expansion of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program that he originally announced in 2012. Well, what happened is... Um, there are approximately 750, maybe 850,000 people who have applied and received deferred action for childhood arrivals under that program. Um, even though this program is an executive authority and can be taken away with the next president's executive authority, the reality is, is our immigration system, our immigration court system, cannot handle out-processing and deporting 700 or 850,000 people. It's just not possible. Uh, the reason why it's not possible is because about three years ago, we had approximately 66,000 people arrive at our borders in the south um, from Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras because of the violence that's there. That pretty much brought our immigration court system to its knees. Um, for most of the middle of the country. Uh, judges were reassigned to handle those cases and to help process those cases. Anybody who was in the uh, deportation court system was essentially put off for years and years, and only those who remained in custody were being handled and addressed at a local level. 
Um, as a result, I have clients who don't have hearings until 2019. Um, so if we were to in, in excuse me, um, if we were to flood the system with 750 or 850,000 people who receive deferred action from that initial program, our system would break. I mean, it frankly did break just with the 66,000 at the border. It would collapse and crumble if we had to process that. So from my standpoint, being in this field, what that tells me is these are just sound bites in order to garner votes in order to get elected. Additionally, even though this is a presidential election and that's what the focus is, Congress has most of the authority regarding immigration um, and changing those laws. And with the exception of executive authority uh, edicts that have been passed, there's very little the president's going to be able to do on his or her own um, to modify the system the way those sound bites are being played. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, you know definitely an issue one way or the other, and you certainly don't hear that rhetoric from the uh, national media that. You know, the immigration system is at its knees with uh, 66,000. Uh, it certainly couldn't handle uh, the problems with deporting 11 million. So uh, you're getting an influx of people calling you or in your office asking questions now because it's at the forefront of their minds. But what is the kind of magic ability that you have to work with these people? Why do people really call you and become your client? Well, there there are a couple of things. I mean, from the services that we provide, we go out of our way to go above and beyond to make sure that our clients are taken care of. Um, our job is to get them through their immigration process as painlessly as possible. Um, one of the things that that we do is, quite frankly, we don't sell them services they don't need. We don't try to sell them false hope just in order to gain a client. We are very straightforward and honest with our assessments regarding their situations. And oftentimes that includes telling clients that they don't have an option. Um, from our standpoint, we are a smaller firm, which means we also work a little bit more or mostly more efficiently and effectively than larger firms do, which also helps keep our fees more reasonable than larger firms. And in addition, my clients will always have access to me when they need it. I have an open door policy, and as we grow and add more attorneys, they too will have an open door policy. And that's probably been the number one complaint from clients that I've had who have worked with other attorneys or other law firms where they said, well, I could never get my attorney on the phone. I was only able to ever talk with the secretary or the paralegal which may be because they're more available, but ultimately they're looking for the lawyer's expertise and I make myself available in order to provide that to them. Yeah, it's uh, very important that personal service, especially when you're dealing with uh, the fears that these illegals are uh, dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, they want answers and they want the correct answers. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, what are a couple of the misconceptions around immigration that you hear every day? I think the, the biggest misconception that we come across is that immigration law for the U.S. is not necessarily difficult. It's just about filling out a bunch of forms. And in reality, that couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, don't get me wrong, there are forms that need to be completed, and for the most part, uh, the, the most important part from our standpoint is making forms eligible for the process they are wanting to apply for. There are all sorts of obstacles that can prevent someone from being successful, and forms just don't provide that information. Um, when you download the forms for free from the immigration websites, you can certainly get the information that you need to put onto the form, but that doesn't necessarily come close to gathering the correct or most compelling supporting documentation that you need for that application process. And I think that the biggest obstacle we have is that we have too many people, whether they be attorneys, 
um, or others who dabble in immigration. Um, you know, maybe it's one of six areas of law that they practice. And having been through the system myself and, and now having my own firm, that is probably one of the more dangerous situations that any immigrant can face because they're not dedicated to the immigration system and understanding its intricacies. It's a very different type of administrative law than, frankly, any other area of law that's out there. Um, and so invariably when clients come to us after they've worked with an attorney who either dabbles in immigration or someone who isn't even an attorney, um, they just went to a friend who said, oh, I did this for my husband, I can do it for you. Well, then their paperwork gets mishandled. Um, we ultimately come in and try and fix their situation as best we can. And if need be, we, you know, we will start all over again. Um, but those situations cause people to be put in a situation where they're going to be facing deportation more than anybody who chooses to invest in their future um, by working with a licensed, experienced immigration attorney. Mm. And what about the people? Obviously, there's a lot of people who do contact you, but there's also others out there that really need the help. But for some reason or another, they're not actually stepping up and calling somebody for professional advice, what would some of the reasons be that they're not making that choice to work with a professional? Well, clearly money is always an issue. Um, what I've found is that when there are clients who choose not to hire us, um, or frankly anybody else for that matter, those folks are generally not in a position where they're committed to moving forward to address their immigration situation. Um, our firm has worked with clients from all walks of life, from those who make very little money to those who are extremely well off. And what we found is that when our clients are committed, they are able to find a way to get the money together to pay us. Um, of course, some people are always going to be calling and shopping around, comparing legal legal services prices and fees, comparing the, the advice that they're given over the phone to the extent anybody gives advice over the phone anymore. Um, but ultimately, we also find those same folks are shopping around to find someone to tell them just what they want to hear. Um, while they end up, may end up making a decision based on price, our clients are really more committed. They want to change their circumstance. They want to do it correctly. And they're willing to do whatever it takes to make that change. And, you know, and then they choose to work with us. And we're very honored for earning their trust. Yeah. And with the help that you can provide, it's going to make a better standard of living for them, even if it's just you know, to have the weight off their shoulders of being in a legal situation and, you know, not facing the risk of getting deported. Absolutely. You know, clients, even after we we regularize their status, um, until they become U.S. citizens, they always have the possibility of being deported depending on what happens. Um, for example, right now, the U.S. Immigration Service is focusing on people who are a broader threat to public safety, which includes people who have been uh, convicted of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, uh, those who have been involved in uh, personal assault-like crimes, whether it be a misdemeanor assault or a felony assault, uh, as well as domestic violence and uh, those who've been involved with either drug possession or drug distribution, those core areas are immigration's primary focus right now, um, it, which makes sense. Um, let's face it, we don't want to have people in our society who can't abide by the rules that take care of all society at one time. Um, but until you become a U.S. citizen, even if you're a lawful permanent resident, you can still have that residency taken away because of something you do in the criminal arena. Um, so while their stress may be alleviated for a short period of time, we very much encourage our clients to con continue that process to the point of citizenship so that they can fully and truly and completely relax and not have to worry about 
being sent out of the country. Mm. Well, Christine, we certainly have covered a lot here today. If there's one thing that we may not have covered that you would really like to share with somebody who is considering uh, contacting yourself or another professional attorney about immigration, what would that be? I think the biggest thing would be to for anybody to find an attorney that they truly trust and that they can build a relationship with. That may be us. We're honored to work with people throughout the United States and, frankly, throughout the world. And we work with them whether they're here in the U.S. or halfway around the world. Um, but you've got to find somebody that you can work with, that you can talk to and talk to honestly. Uh, the information that we don't have will be more dangerous than the information we do. We can't defend against that, which we don't know. Yeah, it's certainly it's all about education when it comes to immigration and filing of all the papers. And, of course, things are changing all the time. And if you're getting advice from a friend who isn't keep, keeping up, uh, it could really hurt in the long run. It does. Well, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to join me on the show today, Christine. Um Give us uh, some information on how people can get in contact with you if they are having some immigration issues. Certainly. Um, our telephone number is 720-414-2027. And, of course, they're always welcome to go to our website at www.immigrationlegaladvice.com. And we'd be happy to chat with them um, and work with them in any way that we can. Well, great. I've learned a lot today. And I uh, thank you again for uh, joining me on the program and sharing all your wisdom about immigration with me. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity, especially in in this election year. It's important to to educate. And I hope I've accomplished a little bit of that today with you. You, you certainly did. Well, thank you again for listening to our audience. And if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share. And we will see you next time on the show. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.